Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch. I'm your host, John Lorden, and I've got a few things to cover just before we get started today. We will get to the pusher very, very soon. Uh, before that, I just wanted to mention that yesterday I recorded an interview with Soraya from Where Did the Road Go? And that will be appearing very quickly. Um, check out Where Did the Road Go? It's actually a featured channel, so if you go to my channel page and look at the channel suggestions that I have, I think right now it's the only one that's over there. Um, very, very cool guy. I really like the podcast. I know many of you uh, like the, well, it's a podcast and a radio show. Um, I know many of you enjoy it as well. It is on the Dark Matter Radio Network, and he also does post his stuff to YouTube as well. So there's several ways you can catch it, as well as it um, being broadcast in Ithaca, I believe. So if you're on the East Coast, be sure to keep your ears out for me appearing on Where Did the Road Go? Now, with all that being said, let's get to the pusher. And this is a case that was suggested uh, quite a, a bit of time ago by many of you brain scratchers out there, pretty much around the time that I started covering the smiley face murder theory. And just to give you a little bit of a brief recap on that, um, the smiley face murder theory is a theory here in the U.S. Uh, where many young college-aged men who are seemingly fit and healthy um, are found in bodies of water and close to where their bodies are found it has been noticed that there is some graffiti in the shape of a smiley face and there are two detectives former detectives uh, now turned authors that were kind of pushing and advancing um, this theory now, if you did watch my previous Brain Scratch coverage on it, you know that I'm a little bit critical of the theory. Um, there's some things that just don't fit quite right for me. The smiley faces don't look like they're being drawn by the same person. It is exceptionally easy to find smiley face graffiti. Um, as a matter of fact, in that episode, I used to live in California, and I mentioned that a hill there had a giant smiley face actually chemically burned into it, so it was permanently burnt into this hill. Um, I was curious when I moved out here to Minnesota, how long would it take me to find the smiley face closest to where I was living now? And I found one that is literally two blocks away, spray painted on the back of a stop sign. So it is not very difficult to find smiley face graffiti. And I think uh, when you consider that there are many deaths that do occur in water, uh, and you try to couple that with finding smiley face graffiti, that you can find a lot of cases where that would match up. Now, one of the things we also covered in that was the statistical probabilities, and it does appear that being a man, um, if you're around a water source, that you do have more of a statistical chance of drowning than a woman does in the same situation. Uh, we talked a little bit about that. We're going to get into that a little bit more as we look through this case. But as I uh, was reading people's comments around that, I started hearing about the Manchester Canals and someone known as the Pusher, a potential serial killer that was, um, in some ways, it kind of fit the smiley face murder theory. Young, college-aged uh, men that were found drowned in, in and around the Manchester Canals. Uh, let's start with an image that I pulled up. This is from the uh, Daily Star, and this is a big article they had put out. Manchester's Killer Canals, Serial Slayer Fear as 61 People Die in City's Waterways. And I've heard a lot of variation about this theory. Um, one of them is that number. Uh, 61, I think, is the lowest number that I've heard. I've heard people bring it all the way up to 90. And essentially, they're saying that that occurred within the stretch from approximately 2006 to 2014 or 2015, depending on what source you look into. Um, I tried to find kind of a definitive list of these names. I couldn't quite find that. If any of you uh, dig in and are able to find a definitive list of the actual victims here, um, please let me know. Please leave a link for the rest of us in the description box below. I found a couple of short lists, but nothing near um, the 60 or 90 that I've heard that might be uh, victims of this crime here. Uh, also, Channel 4 in the UK did a special on this where they investigated um, they sent a retired detective into three specific cases to look into those. And there, while there are certainly some things that are strange about those cases, 
Does it tie into an overall serial killer conspiracy or theory? Um, I don't really know. So let's jump in and see what we can learn. Uh, I'm going to start with just a little quick touch on the Manchester Ship Canal. Now, from what I understand, this is just one part of what is known as the Manchester Canals. This is a 36-mile-long inland waterway in the northwest of England, linking Manchester to the Irish Sea. Um, and you can see a picture of it there. Now, from footage that I've seen from the Channel 4 special, as well as a few other videos I've looked at into here, um, the canal system also runs through the city. There are several kind of thinner channels that run um, almost, it seems like, under the city. There are certain sections where there's a roadway above, and the canals are, um, it looks like a story or two below that. And there are walkways along the canals, and surprisingly, um, it doesn't appear to me that all the walkways look extremely safe. Some of them are wide open to the water, where if someone was going to push you in the water, you would certainly fall in. There's little you could do to stop it. Certain sections of the canals, where particularly where it looks like it goes into tunnels or goes under roads, it looks like they then have uh, handrails that they kind of run along the side of the sidewalk which would make it a little bit safer. But from what I saw of the footage, there are many areas where it's wide open, there is no handrail, and uh, there might even be risks that are even bigger than that in terms of getting around the water there, which uh, we'll check out. Um, Reddit has an article here in their unresolved mystery section about the Manchester Canal deaths. I'm not sure if there are any other Manc people here, but Manchester, UK has a rather extensive canal system. It's pretty old made for shipping back in the 19th century and has since almost completely fallen into disuse. It's to be expected in any city canals that there will be the occasional drunk falling and drowning, but in Manchester, the number of bodies pulled out of the canal is far higher than any other city, 60 in the past few years. It's hypothesized by quite a few here that there's actually a killer or killers stalking the canals and pushing people in. Anyone knowledgeable about this sort of thing have a possible solution? And that was posted by uh, Rhodes Ian Wow, uh, I believe. <laughs> I don't know, there's a lot of different ways to read that, but I just want to give them credit for the post. Uh, we have a response here from Takana. My ex was from Manchester, so I've been up there on a night out a few times. In stretches, the canal is completely unguarded and badly lit with no steps or even grass to mark the proximity of it. I can see how drunk people may stumble in at a higher rate than somewhere like Cambridge where the river is well fenced off and lit. And there are plenty more comments uh, to go through on this, but just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a touch in terms of it does appear like there is some natural risk getting around this canal system. Um, and being safe around it. And it seems like it's noted from people that live there as well as just observers of videos uh, such as myself. So speaking of videos, let's move on to a YouTuber that is known as Curiosity. Um, if I recall correctly, his name is, I believe it's Gary J. Hope I'm getting that right. Um, I've bumped into his videos on a few occasions. I really, really like uh, the level of professionalism that is pulled into his content. He obviously uses a great camera. He gets some really good footage. He does a little bit of man on the street interview. Um, he's, he's kind of a likable guy to watch in terms of these videos. So I kind of wanted to let all of you know about him. He does tread a little bit more into what I consider the creepy storyteller vibe. Um, for example, in this video, um, right from the start of it is pretty much the assumption that there actually is a serial killer out there and he's going to try to find them by walking around in the middle of the night uh, around the Manchester canals. Uh, I just personally wish that his approach was a little more unbiased, but with the Man in the Street interviews, you still do get um, a bit of a wider perspective. There are many people that think there could be a serial killer. There are a few people that suggest, you know, I think the media is kind of propping this up. But um, one thing that's invaluable is seeing the footage of him actually walking around the canals and identifying not just his experience, but some of the risks. So I just want to play a little clip from his video here. Uh, I am still a bit nervous, I must admit. Um, but like I said, I don't even think it's, I'm nervous about the serial killer. I think I'm more nervous about being mugged. 
but now I've got to um, navigate across this beam again or lock now I can tell you that just watching this footage I get nervous for this guy as he's going across this beam and it appears to me that they've added handrails to it um, so this, I don't know if this is an official footpath or if he's climbing on something he's not supposed to, but he needs to get to the other side. There are handrails there, and that is a pretty narrow beam that he's walking on. Um, but outside of that, I also wanted to point out his comment earlier that he was afraid of being mugged while he was down there. Uh, in his video, he does also speak to at least one homeless person. There does appear to be a bit of a hom homeless population around there. So I also have to wonder about of all these potential cases, how many of them are truly college-aged men or young men versus older men versus people that are uh, homeless, might be vagrants of some kind, um, and what is the percentage of people that might actually be going through a crime? I mean, he's worried about being mugged while he's out there. Of those 60 to 90 occurrences, there surely has to be some that are indeed really crimes that are occurring. Um, the big question is, are those isolated crimes, isolated events, or are they being conducted by one person? Or possibly, another theory that I've heard kicked around on this, is it a gang that is conducting these, uh, these crimes? So just to go back to the World Health Organization, I think I brought up, if not this exact same page, a page quite a bit like it when I was looking into the smiley face murder theory. But um, I looked up information on drowning because when you're looking at a case like this, statistics become very important. People that are arguing that there is an actual serial killer here, they don't always realize that they're doing that by compiling stats. I mean, they're trying to say, hey, look, we, we asked the police for information. They returned 60 cases of people drowning. We're saying that that's a trend that is showing us that there could be a serial killer there. To understand that, you have to understand if the statistics make sense to support that that is an unusual trend. So to do that, I try to look at the bigger statistics, um, and we're going to start with the world, but we'll also drill down to the UK in particular. Drowning is the third leading cause of unintentional injury death worldwide, accounting for 7% of all injury-related deaths. There is an estimated 372,000 annual drowning deaths worldwide. So one thing I always talk about um, when I look at stats like this are what, what is the probability that you have a large enough sample set that you could handpick cases and say, hey, look, we have a trend here. And when you're looking at a number as big as 372,000 worldwide, um, that is a pretty large sample set. But you have to also look at the rest of the data to say, is that trend something different than usual? And what's tough about this, if you do just a regular Google search on, um, particularly on trying to find deaths in the Manchester canals, you're going to find tons of results that are all referring to this current trend that has been identified. But trying to find information that predates that is really, really tough. So it's hard to know for certain. Um, has there even been a spike in these deaths at this point? Is this something truly unusual? Or is this just something that has finally been noticed and in it being noticed, people are talking and putting out this theory that may or may not be true? Now, in terms of factors for these deaths, gender. Males are especially at risk of drowning with twice the overall mortality rate of females. Um, some other information I've reviewed actually puts it even higher than that, somewhere to 70 to 80 percent of drowning fatalities are going to occur with males. Studies suggest that the higher drowning rates among males are due to increased exposure to water and riskier behavior, such as swimming alone, drinking alcohol before swimming alone, and boating. Uh, of course, access to water is a big factor and for the smiley face theory um, you know I live in an area in an area where there are plenty of water sources there are literally thousands of lakes out here and of course many of the cases they look into uh, are in this area so of course access to water is going to be a factor in that but other risk factors they also attribute is lower socioeconomic status and of course alcohol use near or in the water 
if you have a part of this city where there are a lot of bars and you have a water canal that is running under that part of the city, um, you are basically putting the conditions together for those types of accidents to be a possibility. So you might have guys that get too drunk, try to walk home, maybe they're looking at their cell phone and they slip, maybe they're feeling sick and they go to the edge of the water to throw up and they fall in. Um, maybe they're looking to relieve themselves on the way home and can't find a bathroom, so they're trying to do that in the water and slip in. There are many different conditions that could possibly happen um, if you are inebriated and around a source of water like this. Now let's talk specifically about the UK. I was lucky enough to find this UK drowning statistics page at, it looks like it's kind of an old website. This is information actually from 2002. And this comes from a website called river-swimming.co.uk. Um, for the information from 2002, you can see that they had 80 instances of drownings where it was someone falling in, I would assume by accident, because I don't, you, you can't fall in on purpose. Um, they have 73 of those drownings that is related to alcohol use. And then they have 34 additional drownings that are the result of swimming. And you can see in this website's analysis, clearly lack of balance, carelessness, or misjudgment together with alcohol are the main problems, and swimming comes in third in that. Now when I was looking at this uh, information, they also noted their inland water temperatures here. Um, I'm not sure if the canals would be considered an inland water temperature source, but I wanted to know um, what, were, what were the average temperatures out there throughout the year, and I couldn't really find it specifically for the Manchester canals. So please take this information with a little bit of a grain of salt. However, we can see that the range of temperatures here goes from about um, 5 degrees Celsius or 40 Fahrenheit, um, gets up to about 25 degrees Celsius or 80 Fahrenheit and not much higher than that. The, ma the majority of the year it is under 20 degrees Celsius or 70 Fahrenheit. And that becomes important when you consider hypothermia. All right, a problem that I have when I look into this case is if you have someone that is a serial killer and their MO is I'm gonna push people into the water what is the likelihood that that person is going to actually die? Um, sure, if I pushed 100 people into the water, maybe I could expect that um, one out of 10 isn't a good swimmer or might not know how to swim at all. So 10 of them might die. But that would leave 90 that survive. That would leave a very good percentage of people that would be able to get back out, contact authorities and say, hey, John pushed me into the water. Um, if you consider other aspects of this, you really have to figure out how would I use that as a mechanism for killing people and hypothermia, I think, would be the best mechanism. If those canals are truly cold enough, uh, hypothermia could set in very quickly. Uh, just to give you a little more information on it, hypothermia is defined as a body core temperature below 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. I was really really uh, surprised to learn that the threshold for hypothermia was uh, such a small variance from our usual temperature. I mean, basically, if you get a person's core body temperature three to five degrees off, um, there is a very good chance that they're dealing with some symptoms of hypothermia. In mild hypothermia, there is shivering and mental confusion. Now, what that tells me is as soon as hypothermia starts to set in, uh, you might lose your sense of direction, your, your logic might not work appropriately. If you are in a part of the canals where there isn't a ladder that you could easily get out of, you might have trouble trying to figure out how to get to some place where you could pull yourself out. Um, to know that mental confusion is part of such an early onset of hypothermia might help explain why in slip and fall situations at least, people um, aren't able to get themselves out of the water quickly and then of course have to deal with more severe symptoms. In moderate hypothermia, shivering stops and confusion increases. In severe hypothermia, there may be paradoxical undressing in which a person removes his or her clothing as well as an increased risk of the heart stopping. It classically occurs from extreme exposure to cold. 
So I do think that there is a possibility that if someone was pushed into the water, um, maybe you could use that as a method of conducting a murder. Could you use that as a reliable method of being a serial killer and know that every time you push someone into the water, they're going to die? Uh, I don't know. From the temperature chart that we were looking at a little bit earlier, it looks like in several months out of the year, particularly through the summer months, I believe, uh, the temperature gets high enough where people are probably going to have quite a bit of time in the water before they succumb to some of these symptoms of hypothermia. So uh, I think if that was the case, we'd probably hear from some survivors that uh, there was someone going around pushing people in, but I have not seen any information to suggest that whatsoever. Here at ManchesterEveningNews.co.uk, they actually put a map together of some of the cases. Um, I think this is only about 20 of the cases, but I was curious as I started going through the map. Uh, here we do see someone that's 21, Michael Plunkett. Here we see someone that's 22, Chris Brainy. Um, as we move along, we have an 18 year old. Here we have name unknown. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I'm not even sure of the sex. This could potentially be a man, potentially be a woman. Here we have another name unknown, 40 to 50 years old. Um, once again, I don't know if this information is being redacted for some reason or if possibly uh, these could be homeless people, maybe, where their identity is not known. Um, we have a 78-year-old here, and I did bump into some information about elderly people in particular having trouble around water sources and becoming a victim of drowning. So that one seems like an occurrence that might be easier to explain. Um, we have a 21-year-old. There is certainly a trend of some young men, um, but here we have a 52-year-old. Here we have another 20, 21 year old. Here is a 60 year old, 20 year old, 39 year old. I would say that at most one out of two of these cases is someone in their 20s um, with the other half ranging. This guy is 65 or 66, uh, ranging in age considerably. And it seems like middle-aged men are probably a risk category as well. Here we have a name unknown person in their 30s and another name unknown person in their 30s. But I'm just surprised that even the official media around this seems to have trouble putting the information together of just a plain list that really shows us the trend and supports this theory. Um, some of the theories that I've heard around this are that gay men were targeted. Uh, in the Channel 4 special they did, they pretty plainly call out, we know that many of these victims are not gay men, so it doesn't seem to be someone that is targeting gay men in particular. Um, there have been other trends reported, such as their age, which as we can see from this chart, is this really young men? We have a person in their 70s, many people in their 40s, 50s, 60s. It just it doesn't seem like there's even a solid trend of young men that especially one that breaks the convention that we know of men being a high risk category for these types of drownings. So how did this all start? Where does all this information come from and how does this type of uh, theory start in the first place? I'm taking a look at mirror.co.uk. Is serial killer dubbed the pusher murdering men in Manchester by shoving them into canals? More than 80 bodies have been pulled from waters in Manchester over the past six years, nearly all young men and many in the gay village area. How did the pusher theories begin? The cases were first publicly linked following a freedom of information request which found there had been 61 bodies discovered in canals between February 2008 and January 2015. Professor Craig Jackson, head of psychology at Birmingham City University, examined the figures and stated the deaths had, quote, all the hallmarks of foul play. It is unlikely that such a high number of cases are the result of just accidents or suicides, as canals are not popular suicide spots, especially for men. Um, however, it is worth noting, Professor Jackson later withdrew his remarks in a statement released by Greater Manchester Police after being called in for a meeting with Detective Chief Superintendent Russ Jackson. This article then details um, several of the victims of drowning in this area. 
And those individual stories, um, that's one thing I do appreciate about the Channel 4 special is that they take time to look into these individual cases. In one of the cases, the parents were trying to call uh, their son and he appeared to pick up the phone, they said, but he wasn't responding and they heard a horrible shriek from him and then the phone eventually went dead. Um, so knowing facts like that, uh, in one way it raises the mystery, is there something really going on here? Was he potentially a victim of foul play? But knowing that they weren't really communicating with him, that he wasn't answering them back on the phone, is it possible that his phone just an answered their incoming call while it was in his pocket? Is it possible that he was screaming as he hit the cold water as he fell in? Um, they didn't mention hearing any type of water or splash, but uh, they did mention that the mother had the phone. She had to hand it over to the father because she was getting so worried about what was going on. You do figure that a person falling into a body of water, there should be a clear splash that you would hear, but it would probably last for only a few seconds. Uh, but then as a person struggling in the water, you would probably hear water thrashing around. So I don't know. Um, it's, it's weird because in some ways they did a good job of going and at least talking to these families and getting their side of the story, but I didn't hear a lot of good questioning to either support or deny the stories that were being told by the families, which I think is a little bit of a missed opportunities, uh, of a missed opportunity, particularly because it could help the family maybe come to grips with what went on there. Maybe it would help them process things a bit differently. Um, rather than thinking that you know there's potentially a serial murder out there when there could be or might not be. Man, it's really tough to phrase that, but I think you guys see which way I'm leaning on this. I'm really having trouble thinking that there is legitimately a serial murder conducting this. Uh, I just can't find the information to support it here. The MOs of the crimes are very difficult to know um, because we don't know enough details about them. Uh, the special also tells you that in most of these cases, the uh, coroner actually came to a conclusion about how the person died. In a number of them, somewhere around, I think, 25 to 30 of them, the coroner could, could not conclude what happened to the person that caused their death. Um, so that leaves this big question mark where many people are kind of able to fit this theory into it. Uh, without looking into the, each of these cases individually, it's very hard to say for certain what's going on here and is there truly a trend seen in this. I've looked into quite a few cases about people dying in water and one of the big things that I've come to understand about it is it's extremely difficult because you find the body at a location but that isn't necessarily the location of whatever happened to this person. In only one case in many that I've looked into, has the site of where the person fallen into the water been understood? And that was because the person actually dropped their car keys and their wallet, if I remember correctly, at the edge of the water before they fell off the bridge and went in. In most cases, you don't get a clear indicator like that. So finding bodies in one location, um, that's not necessarily the crime scene. It makes these things very tough to process. Uh, and there is something to be said about water that uh, could be taking away evidence. I mean, for example, fiber evidence could be washed off of a person. Uh, certain types of trace DNA can be washed off. Um, in one of these cases, it was noted that the person's jacket was missing, his cell phone was missing, his wallet was missing, but the detective that was looking into it I thought made a very good point that you know he could have had those items in his jacket and as he was in the water the jacket might have come off of him and, and separated from him at some point so it's it's weird because a lot of people will look at the location that a body is found and for some reason there's an assumption right off the bat if the body's in water and this isn't the same as if it's on land but a lot of people make the assumption of well if something happened in that area uh, when you find a body two weeks later in water, it could have come from many miles away. It could have come from a completely different part of the city, maybe even a different part of the country. So it, it makes it really, really tough when you're looking at cases like this. Who else is supporting these claims? An author specializing in psychopaths is convinced a serial killer is killing men in Manchester's gay area by pushing them into canals. Mr. Sheridan 
51 from Northern Ireland visited Manchester to research the deaths in canals and rivers and says he was followed by, quote, a tall man wearing a hood. Now, I'm telling you guys, I'm really trying not to become so cynical and critical of authors, but you're followed by a guy wearing a hood and that's worth even mentioning in an article about this? Do you think it was the murderer? If so, why? Give us some information around this. Is it really that hard to be followed by someone? I, I just, I don't get this at all. If you watch that YouTube video that I mentioned earlier from Curiosity, he even notes he's surprised at how many people are out there at that time of night. He just didn't expect that he would see that many people in, walking around in the darkness like that. Uh, apparently, it is not very hard to run into people out there, but here we have an author that makes money specializing in telling stories about psychopaths and it looks like he's trying to push the story that potentially there is a psychopath going on here as well. I don't know if he's written a book about this yet, but I would bet you one's coming soon. What do the police say? Well, we can actually hear it from directly from them. They released a YouTube video uh, a day before Channel 4 aired their special on this. And if you are interested in the Channel 4 special, I know I've talked about it a lot in this video, there's a link for it in the description box below, as well as this video, as well as Curiosity's video, as well as every website that I've reviewed here, so you can jump into the research for yourself. And of course, if you find other links to information on this case, please include it in the comments below, and we can get that shared with everyone. But let's see what the police say in this case. If a person has pushed somebody into a canal and we've been able to investigate it, that person has been traced, they've been interviewed, uh, and on one such an occasion, one of these individuals has been interviewed. CPS have offered no charges because of the circumstances around it uh, and no prosecution uh, has ensued. So there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever to support the story uh, in the papers. So two pretty important things I take from that. First of all, he's saying there's no evidence to support this serial killer myth. But outside of that, he does say that they have specific instances where someone was pushed into the water. Um, and in another part of this video, I think he talks about the fact that someone was robbed and pushed into the water. So it's tough, especially if you're trying to, you know, kind of hit the naysayers approach on this theory, because you do have actual instances where, yes, someone has used this as a device to kill someone by pushing them in the water. Now. Does that mean that it's a serial killer? Does that mean that all these cases fall into that? According to the police's information, clearly it does not. And just a little more information on that. DCI Marsh said that a number of deaths were due to alcohol, while others were cases of suicide. He said some are older men, some have committed suicide and left their belongings on the side. So we also do hear directly from the police that there is a number of these that are suicides. Um, once again, I wish someone would just put an Excel sheet out there and say, here's all the names, here's the sex, so that we could at least break that down. Here's the age, so that we can at least understand if that's really a trend or not. You can include sexuality in there if you want. I really don't think that there's anything in particular about gay men being targeted here, but maybe they could add that to this Excel sheet. Uh, and let us go through it for ourselves, sort and twist this, and see if the data really supports the stories that are being told about it. My hunch is, just from the small data that I've been able to find on this, that it doesn't. But that is my personal opinion. You are certainly more than entitled to yours. Now, just one more little piece of info I want to share with you before I let you go today. This is from ROSPA.com, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents. And this is their drowning statistics. And I was very happy to find uh, a source of information that includes years before this 2006, 2008 to current range that we keep hearing about in modern press. So here we have the total number of accidental drowning deaths from 1983 to 2013. And if you can see that trend, it is quite consistently going down. Now, I do believe that some people could argue, well, these aren't accidental deaths we're talking about. Um, how are murders being categorized in this? Or even suicides, are they included in this? I don't think so. But looking at this as a general figure, 
of deaths due to drowning, in particular accidental drownings, people slipping and falling, it does look like it's on the decline. Once again, I have to call out, I don't have information from before 2006 for Manchester drowning deaths to compare it to and say, hey look, year over year, you guys have the same amount of deaths in those canals. Um, so even that is, is very tough about this case. But this is where I turn it over to you. I know there's a lot more information out there to look into. Um, please search it out. If you find anything interesting, share it with the rest of us. Uh, I am always willing to change my opinion, but as of right now, the way I'm looking at this, this does not appear to be a serial killer. This appears to be a combination of deaths going on, some accidental, some natural, some suicides, maybe even some that are homicides, but this overarching theory that there is one person or one gang responsible for doing this to all those people, um, I just don't feel real comfortable with it. I can't say that I believe in it at this time. But will you be the one to dig out the information to change my mind? Believe me, it's happened before. Um, please check into this case. Let me know if you find anything interesting. Thank you so much for spending time with me today on Brain Scratch. I appreciate each and every one of you. Appreciate? Did I say that right? Or did I put it? the appreciate in there? Either way, <laughs> thank you guys so much. I'm really happy that you're here. Take care, have a great weekend, and I'll see you on the next show on the Lord Narks channel.